morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we really are in a different category from everybody else because we do a lot of the problem solving. And so we use everything we can get. I want you to become, at the end of this, a little bit more aware of our State Library resources and to look at some strategies for flexible and successful searching. I think that CARA has made it really clear that we're struggling often with a number of problems to find those records. And I think um, Sadia has indicated pretty clearly that things changed a great deal over time. So what we would like to show you is how the SLQ resources and services relate to those repositories. Okay, State Library has got a family history focus because our records are collected for the family historian but there are a lot of records that simply because of their nature benefit the family historian. This is the state collection and it's a very, very significant one. These are the sorts of holdings we've got. Firstly, all Australian indexes, not just Queensland ones. Um, and we've also got the lists for the 19th and early 20th century. I think you will have realised from what Sadia and Cara have said that it's a pretty messy patchwork. We've also got databases, but only because of the conditions that are laid down are they on site. And those, those particular databases are Ancestry Library, that is the library edition, not just the individual owner um, database and find my past and they provide access to many overseas lists as well as Australian ones. We've also got lots of newspaper accounts, uh, in, you know, including Trove. Uh, the, the State Library is the major collector of the Queensland uh, newspapers and through Trove we have access to a huge range from all the ports over Australia. There are books and diaries uh, John Oxley collects most of those and a number of them have been digitised and are actually available on site if you use our catalogue. And of course, images of ships. Um, Sadia showed you the Artemisia, the first one to come directly to Moreton Bay and a photograph we all use probably ad nauseum because it was such a big event and the Moreton Bay Courier got particularly overexcited about it, as did the Illustrated London News, but there are many, many more. We collect not just government records, and government records is what state archives and national archives collect. We also collect non-government records, newspapers, books, personal collections, diaries and photographs. And a lot more of that is now being emphasised with the John Oxley collection. But the play, how do you find all this? I mean, where do you bring it all together, for goodness sake? And we do have a family history page. And, and that website is in your notes. And there you will find guides. We've got dozens. Indexes on the web. We've got a few, but we'd like to add many, many more. And we've got our useful websites. And we have links within those websites to where you mainly want to go and on that page we have links to Ancestry and Find My Past. So we have resources that are electronic, microform and printed and what do I use? The lot. These are some excerpts from our family history page. You get to it from the main page by going to resources and then family history as you can see on the left then to e-resources. That's where you will link to our useful websites and where you will also find our e-resources. As I said, that's in your notes. And we do need the wide scope of records, as many of you will understand, because we're mainly an immigrant people and we're on the move. So you need the wide geographical scope that goes beyond Queensland and beyond Australia. And again, just I know I'm emphasising it, but non-government records are very important for personal information. Finding the arrivals, which is where we come in, you know, quite a bit. It's really, really important and I think that this is really emphasised 
by CARA, you have to cross-check and it's quite a long process. In fact, many people will tell us 10 or 20 years. And oh, how my heart lifts with the excitement when I get that letter that starts off, I have been searching for 10 years. And I think you expect me to find it in an hour. Okay. So it's not easy and not always possible, but we do work at the occasional miracle. And of course, it comes out, you know, in a two or three line thing like, found them on this list. And, you know, yet, yet it can be quite a search. Chain migration. People say, oh, they'd have come together. Well, no, often someone came first and then others eventually followed once they were sure they could set the family up. And just to repeat what Cara said, those who may be, uh, who paid may be listed with initials only. Not a first name, no personal name. How do we know that John Smith is your John Smith? Especially when their ages were just a lucky dip or fitted exactly the description that was required for immigrants at the time. Another issue, and we're going to look at this, family members on board in different classes were often not listed together. And especially when they spell their names differently, that is not just from what their real name was, but it's different from one to the other, that can be pretty thrilling too. So you need to check shipping lists from other Australian colonies or states. We became states in 1901. Individuals may be recorded with names other than their familiar ones and only for the most honourable of reasons. But the point is that there are many errors, as we keep saying. They can be, names can be heard incorrectly. Mr Maloney said, we only ever spelt it this way. Don't use those wild cards. Well, you know, use the wild cards. I can tell you there are at least four variations on Maloney. They can be spelt variously and they can be transcribed incorrectly. Now, the person writing it down is not necessarily the person whose name it is. And, of course, names change quite a bit. And you all tell me about it, don't worry. The place of arrival is different from that of destination. Immigrants may travel by coastal vessel or other means. And they came together, yes, not necessarily on the same ship. But they planned it together and they came fairly close together. Just to reiterate our general search strategy, and Cara certainly emphasised it, no more information than is strictly necessary. Keep it simple. Use truncation and wild cards. Truncation is when you cut a word right back to its stem and you use whatever that wild card is. It might, it's usually an asterisk, maybe a percentage sign. Different variables in changing combinations can sometimes help. Use the least common first name before searching for a family's arrival. Research back from yourself. If you've got a name like I've got, Ryan, and everybody who ever came from Tipperary <laughs> only ever has the same first names. When my great-grandparents came out, there were three Dennis Ryans, three Mary Ryans. Now, only one of each was mine and the whole place teamed with them. If I hadn't have gone carefully back, well, we won't go there. <laughs> oh. Okay, so when and where did they arrive? How many times we asked it? The death certificate gives you the time and place of arrival. The trouble is that people filling out the death certificates didn't always know. So it was approximately 30 or 35. Fives and zeros can be suspect. Identify the last document, a documented event in the country of origin, the first documented event in Australia. And those can be births, marriages, censuses, naturalisations. Obituaries, diaries, letters, other government records, and you can find those in the uh, government archives from whom we've been listening, from whom we've heard, um, the parliamentary votes and proceedings, police gazettes and hospital records. And, of course, we have the votes and proceedings and police gazettes here. 
one of the main places to search, is, search for people coming to Moreton Bay or Queensland is in New South Wales. We were part of New South Wales till 59. When the Artemisia came to Moreton Bay, they were coming to northern New South Wales as they were until 1859. People, even after that, move very freely between the two colonies or states and it's forgotten or unknown that the family came elsewhere. The ship arriving in Victoria or New South Wales will be recorded on that state's list, even if they moved up to Queensland. But on the death certificate, it'll just say Queensland. So this is where you have to be on the hunt. To reiterate, assisted passengers in New South Wales, extensive information for those years. Unassisted passengers, and these are not on the New South Wales um, State Archives um, site, but they are, yeah, they're there in bits and pieces. You need ancestry for that. Um, and once again, how do you find it? Go to useful websites, New South Wales, online indexes, immigration and shipping. And there is Ancestry Library and you'll soon find your way there. We've also got the lists and on Microform and on the net. I've used both. You need to. Um, assisted migrants got financial help at some level. I'm not going to in, into any detail on that. I think that both of the previous speakers have covered it very well. Same with unassisted, little detail. I've got the old page from the State Records of New South because it points out what they have up to 59. So Moreton Bay, 48 to 59, Sydney and Newcastle to that period and the other areas they cover, even in Port Phillip, which later became Victoria. Oh, yeah, okay. So when and where did the Moonies arrive? Well, firstly, Mooney is a common name. Patrick Mooney is also a common name. But there are certain advantages. If you work your way back, and I can't emphasise that enough, you don't just say Patrick Mooney arrived somewhere in the 19th or 20th century. But he died in, in 1851 as an elderly man of 51. So the outer date is 51. When his widow, Margaret Mooney, died, this was after 1856, so you now get civil or government records of death. And that tells us that she was 39 years in Queensland. Now, we love that 39 rather than 40 because that gives us a more precise idea and, in fact, they arrived in 1850. We also are looking for certain people with Patrick Mooney, his wife Margaret and his daughters Anastasia and Ellen. But we can see that down at the bottom there were other children who had died by the time Margaret did. If we do a search of the Queensland deaths and we can do it without a surname, but if we put the parents' names in, Margaret O'Brien and Patrick Mooney, we bring up James and Mary. So we know, we know we're looking for James, Mary, Anastasia, Ellen, Margaret and Patrick. So if we go to their records, we put in the surname and we put Anastasia obviously is a nightmare. So cut it back, truncate it, use the wild card, which in this case is the percentage sign, go 1849 to 1851 and there you have Anastasia on the Cornwall in 1850 and the reels listed that... Um, denote their arrival. So then we then get rid of Anastasia's name from the search field. We put in the ship that we've now found, the Cornwall, the year 1850, and there are all the family members. And there, of course, is Patrick. He's shed 11 years. <laughs> because they didn't want people who were not able to work and 40 was the upper age. Just remember there'll be anything required to get that free passage. And so 
the we, we've already heard about the um, from from um, Sadia about the immigration agent list and the department list. The immigration department collected a lot of information because they were paying. And of course, naturally, it's the least readable. Now, the Irish are our major nightmare in searching for records. So it is a great blessing to find um, the parents of Patrick Mooney indicated, Roger and Anastasia, both dead. Note the question mark next to his age, entirely justified. <laughs> Margaret's parents, William and Joanna, and Brian, spelt quite differently, and her father was still living in Ulla in Limerick. So that's very useful information. But hang on, they're on a, a Sydney list and they came to Moreton Bay and we know they were only in Moreton Bay. How come they would come to a derelict convict settlement uh, with no family? This is going to be an interesting thing we're trying to find. There is the immigration agents list, less information but much clearer, so it's worth checking. Now, these you can see on film or you can see them on Ancestry. They are from the state records. So here we have in mind, well, what are they doing here? And the Sydney Morning Herald explained that. When people got free passages and they came in and there were too many people in one place or other areas really needed the migrants, they'd simply be moved around. So in this case... 26 came to Moreton Bay. Now, in 1850, 300 were sent up from, um, from Sydney to northern New South Wales. So they came up probably with a little bit of encouragement. Um, land was on offer and he bought 30 acres. So they came into Sydney, not to Moreton Bay. And the death certificate gives you no idea they went to Sydney but they moved on pretty quickly with a little bit of encouragement from the government. They came to a derelict place. We're looking p at people coming to Queensland or Moreton Bay, but we don't always find them on the Queensland lists, especially the unassisted. So here we get Minnie Curd, a most unfortunate name, I would have to say. <laughs> Was it Gerd? Well, okay, if, if Minnie's your relation, do follow her up at State Archives. <laughs> so there she is on a Victorian list coming to Brisbane. So, okay, then we find Minnie, um, and I'm told now that she's Gerd, not Curd. Um, but isn't it wonderful that we? she was asked for as Curd and we found her. <laughs> and we find her on that wonderful series, J715, coming into Brisbane. Now, just to reiterate about that J715, it's on the net, it's digitised. Um, Queensland Family History has done an index, but who wants to go through the 17,000, 1,795 1, 1, pages on many reels? because they don't indicate what pages those ships are on. So we have a, um, a very hard-working, very frustrated um, volunteer trying to put the pages for each list. Okay, Wordsworth. This query came to us from Victoria, and this woman said, all of my research is in Victoria, but this, this woman married so quickly after she arrived that she must have come straight to Queensland. Well... Not quite. Her name was Carolyn Wordsworth. She was 39. She came with her sons Charles and William. We can find her on the Victorian lists inwards. And this, and, and again, someone's mentioned this, that they also record the outwards lists in Victoria. So they're not staying there. We can find them coming in and going out. We were able to locate the time because she was a widow and over on the at the top left you can see that her husband, Charles Favell IV Wordsworth, abbreviated to Charles FF, 
died in 74. And even though he was a, you know, a Queen's Council, etc., etc., these wealthy, high-placed people didn't ever save for their widows and children. So it was often instant poverty. He was 67, but he had a young family and wife. So there are Caroline, William and Charles on the Victorian list going to Sydney. But we couldn't find them on the Sydney list. Why not? When we look for Wordsworth variant spelling, one of the good things about Ancestry is you can search by the name of the ship and the date of arrival and then you can search or alternatively you get out the film. I do both. And there we can find them. Caroline Wordsworth is, is, um, in, is recorded as Carolyn Wadsworth. Now, her son Charles is in a different category. Caroline's in third cabin. He's in steerage. And he is recorded as Ward, W-A-R-D, Wadsworth. Now, when the second letter is wrong, it's often a problem. But they weren't even consistent on that one list. But, of course, you know to go in and look because of the Victorian list. Now, we, you know, we're still a bit bamboozled because, you know, we're looking at the right people. We, it, the names measure up. But the obituary tells us that she arrived in Townsville in 1879. In fact, she arrived in 1880. She arrived into Sydney in June. She'd married by the beginning of September. This is what's called pretty hard work. So there she is, married in Queensland and had, at the age of 40, three more children. And they said she's a pretty hardy woman and the evidence is yes. But can you see, they're coming to Queensland but we're finding them and tracking them elsewhere. If I'd tried to find them on the New South Wales list first, I probably wouldn't have. But I knew to look from the Victorian list and I knew... As with a lot of obituaries, they get some information right, but some of it's not right. So here we have here, James Roger Wilkes. This is one that had done the rounds, you know, it, as in I've been looking for 10 years and am frustrated. And the story was that he'd come especially to Queensland to build some equipment. Okay, we knew that, there was a, that he'd had a baby... And when we looked up free BMD, we saw that that baby was born in December 1885 or in the December quarter. Now, there's a pretty big, you know, it's more than likely that he was hanging around then in 1885. They were having children in Queensland in 1888, but he's not on the list. Again, we're picking him up in Victoria using the advanced search putting the dates 1885 to 1888 and not even using his second name, James, you know, which is Roger, James, you know, James Roger, just James Wilkes. And here we find him on the Lusitania. He arrived in April and we can see because it's the Victorian list that he's going out. But this is the beauty of the Victorian fuzzy searching, which is also a nightmare, by the way, that he's even though we put in James, it's picking up James Roger and J. Roger Wilkes. And here is where we get to the, the cruel truth of the lists. Many of them aren't beautiful. In fact, are almost impossible to read. If you can see that, you'll see that James Roger Wilkes was a riveter going to Sydney. This is the Victorian list. So what happened to his wife? Well, again, the least common name of the children was Maud. And when we put in Maud, we find that they came in on the Aberdeen in 1886. Get rid of her name, just put in the surname, the ship and the year, and there they all are. The children, that is, and the wife. And they're the reels to look at. The higher numbered one gives you the greater detail and naturally is close to unreadable. And the lower one is clearer 
but lacks the detail. And there they are. And when you look at that list, they are all wives joining their families. So she came from Staffordshire and um, the question is, relations in the colony? Well, she had a husband, another one had a brother. So they were joining their families. It was quite an interesting list to look at. This relates to um, a, an artist and the standard comment was about whom little is known. And somebody who was restoring his work was desperate to find it out. But he knew that he went to Dunwich. He contacted Queensland State Archives because Dunwich was a government facility and found out that he came to Brisbane in 1870 on the ship Merribra. Now, this is kind of like an extraordinary breakthrough because he's been written about quite a lot and you'll see his artwork on the um, Trove National Archives. That's a little bit of an indication that you can get a lot of information elsewhere other than on shipping records. And here he is on the wonderful J715. I don't think I've actually emphasised how incredibly grateful we are for them putting that up. So we couldn't find him. Uh, the name index is on two CD-ROMs to 1899 and on Find My Past. But we've also got an SLQ volunteer indexing the date range. So we can find out his ship from that index, but then we can find the pages of the Meribra. Now, that hasn't been made publicly available yet and our um, volunteer is suffering a lot trying to work out the Chinese names and the order of the records, but eventually we hope that with a lot of our other material it will go up. Now, that's the list for Australia, but if we look at the Liverpool England crew lists, we see a little bit more clearly Charles Gordon Hurst. He was an assistant baker and discharged at Brisbane. And this is his um, agreement and account. And we find out that his previous ship was the Barham, which is interesting because he writes a lot about being in India and that's where it was. This was a little mystery that came to us over about four inquiries and a few of the staff who've worked on it are here. Um, the Frings of Brisk Island. I was trying to find John Frings's grandson and then I see this little boy and I think that might be him but then I know that that isn't his wife his wife is down south but here we have a Mrs Frings with a little boy and who is this Florence Isabel Frings look up the electoral rolls on ancestry and we have a Florence Isabel Frings um, of Brisk Island who is a literary assistant. John Frings is a writer at this stage. Now, we've all seen those sidebars that are automatic hinting, and most of you would know always be highly suspicious of them because in an era of traditional naming patterns, there'll be lots of people with the same name. But when you're the sole occupant of an island, you're the lessee, you know everyone there is connected to you, so we see that Florence Isabel Frings was actually Florence Isabel Meek, not on any of the Australian birth records. Okay, and these are the records we can see. So Florence Isabel uh, Meek was um, obviously Florence Isabel Frings at the same place as a literary assistant in all cases. If we look at the State Archives Index, um, 1922 to 1940, we can see that Florence Meek arrived on the 22nd of April, 1924 on the Diogenes. But if we look at the British records, we get a bit more information. We find that she's a clerk, that she's 27, and that she comes from Thames Ditton in Surrey which is an interesting little bit of accumulation of information for when she returns. Because we saw her with Charles Chevelle and her husband in 1935, but in 1936, the sole lessee of Brisk Island, 
John Frings dies. So she returns to England. And there we see them on the index, Mrs F.I. Frings and Master J.A. Frings. And she is returning to Thames, Ditton, Surrey. So we've been able to find her coming and going and her rather intriguing presence on Brisk Island while his wife is down south. But we won't go into that. Um, but what happens to this woman? See, this is it. These men die and they're basically stranded. And this is where the fabulous 1939 register comes in, which is a census substitute. And we find that she is at South End on Sea. So we look at the records and we unlock the household and go through all that drama they love. And we see that she's actually living with another family. And when we then go in, we discover that she is doing paid domestic duties. She's become a servant, but intriguingly, she's just dropped five years. She was born on the 30th of September 19, uh, 1896, but she's kept the, the, the day and the month, but just dropped five years. Her son must be in boarding school because he's simply not listed. Even if he were listed, it would have a black bar that it was officially closed because he wouldn't have been 100 when these were released. So then when we compare the GRO online, which is the General Register Office in England, we can see, uh, and I know that that must be very difficult to see, that she was born in the December quarter of 1896. When she died, she was also, she died and her age is recorded as having been the 30th of September 1896. So we know we've got the right person. The shipping records allowed us to put her story together and it also indicated to us that we can get a bit more information from records of those leaving England as well as those arriving. I just want to go through a few errors here. Um, and this is to do with an Ida Wheeler. One of our amazing, truly astonishing staff did this. And it was an, a, a re request from England to find Ida Wheeler. Now, this ship sunk and so it became very important that the list was right. But inaccurate names were given. Ida Johns, Miss W. Johns, Miss C. Johns. It was corrected and then it became Miss C. Wheeler. And then it was corrected again. This is now May that the third record comes out. Miss Ida Wheeler and Servant C. Johns. But it was the initial list that was printed in the London Times which led to the query. So always be wary of what's printed. Mrs Lance Rawson we found on a list from looking at newspaper accounts of when the ship left and the date of arrival and her name. When we then tracked back through the index, we found she's recorded as Mrs Laus Kaowen. Don't rely on the indexes. George Alfred Carthew Wright, could we find George Wright? Came in the end of the 19th century, maybe early 20th. No. But the person who was searching for this after a year discovered he could look at the hospital records at Croydon, found out that he said that he arrived in the Makara, misspelled, and when they looked at the two of the records, he found that it was around about 1893 or 4. It took a minute. Find my past, travel and migration, and then... Nothing more than a surname, don't worry about George, 1893 plus or minus two years, the ship Makara, just those little bits and bingo, there's GAC Wright. Now, he'd have to get off at Thursday Island. We've got those records, why can't we find it? There he is, Normanton, GAC Wright, George Alfred Carthew. And, of course, naturally... Two people got off at Thursday Island, one of whom was Mrs G.S. Wright. So we had no way of finding him because it was incorrectly recorded. And fortunately, there were only two people who got off. 
Another one, the Skyrings, early settlers in Brisbane, first land purchasers. What was happened here is the, they were indexed with the wolf. The wolf was a, was a whaler. And it actually says on the list there were no passengers. They actually were indexed with the ship following rather than the ship earlier. And, uh, and thank goodness the shipping intelligence was right. The Duns, they were there as Dumel. Now, one of th this is a, co a comparison of what you'll get on a state records index and ancestry. Now, if they got those townlands right, it was valuable information because that's how you're going to find these impossible Irish. And when you look at the list, in fact, it wasn't this Glau Hetty at all. It was Kulna Manor, Glanna Hilty, and the child didn't even have a townland because it was just born on board the ship. Missing German ships. Some wonderful thing is called Ancestry. A long-suffering volunteer is indexing those. And those two ships of the early 1850s, Solon and Bremen, uh, Solon and Diana are there. I'm not going to go through all of those records because you've got them in your notes. But this is the substitute for finding the shipping lists. Two pages of them here. Immigrants from Hamburg. Again, could we find an Adeline Mask? Looked by her first name. She was there as Mashka. But, of course, they're just going to make it sound Australian. Elizabeth Schultz Niebotcher came on the Moriarty, um, as you can see, just above her photograph. Uh, in fact, they said the British consul. The ship changed its name. And we can check that on the um, report in the paper and also in Lloyd's Register, where it tells us it changed its name. So you've got the issue of German spelling, different form of the first name and change of ship name. And do we ever have it? People have a way of when they record this in their Bibles and letters and every other way of making it sound more familiar. The La Rochelle became the Laura Shell, the Laurie Shell, the La La Shelley. Um, the Lusitania became the Louisitania. The Caddo Wattel became the Caddo Waddle. And Raja Gopal became the Roger de Paul. I assume a relation of Vincent. We've got some wonderful ways of tracking some of these through the ship's picture index from the Australian National Maritime Museum. They've taken theirs down. We've added our own um, records of um, books. Lloyd's Register and, of course, the fabulous trove none of us have raved about, but very important. Take a look at our guides, shipping lists and more than lists, which were on the table. Charlie's List, where he's tried to bring together as much as possible given it, I'm just noting that um, Sadi was saying they're going to put more up, but it brings together the records of state archives, national archives and the state library. It was a feat over years and we're still waiting for it to go on the net. It's organised alphabetically by the ship's name and by the ship's date of arrival. Find out about the ships in Trove, um, the Index and Lloyd's Register. We have a wonderful book on the ships of the 1880s when Queensland had a, a contract with the BISN line which gives you pictures and a wonderful summary and lots on the 1860s as well when the Queensland government had a contract with the infamous Black Ball line. Shipboard diaries, a lot of them online um, and what never ceases to amaze me reading them, now, a lot of the stuff that goes on is pretty standard but they act as tourists in their own countries. They go to visit, you know, Kew and see what all the plants and things are. Or in the case of this Frederick James Merchant, he went, and I still bamboozles me, from Liverpool, a sh major shipping port, to Glasgow to get the train. And he went to the art galleries there. And that's what is fascinating. But you can see the sorts of things they record. The journeys varied in their route. Especially in the 1880s, they came through sewers and down the coast. And as Sadia said, they will rec be recorded as they come down the coast in the different categories of assistance or otherwise. But, of course, there are other fabulous journeys where they went 
around Victoria or Tasmania. A story for another day. Newspapers, including Trove, have all those wonderful notices. You know them, they're in your notes. Reports can be fascinating. Because we were paying, or Australians or Queenslanders were paying, people loved to tell you what they thought of the passengers. In this case, and this is from a, you know, something that was, you know, 150 years later, they got the name of the ship wrong, should be the Great Pacific, and it tells you the single men are an undersized boyish looking lot, while the generality of the married men are a vigorous set. Several of them have a clean and vigorous appearance. Taking them as a whole, they're an inferior shipment. <laughs> and during the passage took all that lay and the power of the surgeon, superintendent, captain to keep them in order. Now, for whatever reason, the people in Rocky, who are the relations of those, are desperate for copies of it. <laughs> there are no prizes for being good in family history. <laughs> Obviously, the index is to multiple resources, ancestry and find my past. Huge advantages, but major drawbacks. Inaccurate links, automatic hinting can be a problem, indexing can be poor, but re and records can be missing. Wide variety of records, and you can get free access for three hours a day. Those who disappear may have died, moved elsewhere, had a change of name, a broken marriage, ended up in an asylum, and that could be for any number of reasons other than mental illness or even in prison. And that's pretty good if they do because often there are good records. Our useful websites are a good way of connecting and there should be sheets outside. I've just put three of the examples. National Archives, State Records of New South and Queensland State Archives. Note that we've got links to the key points you need to go to. So when you sort of say, my God, she's given us an awful lot of information, at least have a look at that family history page. So identify the window of arrival. Somewhere in the 19th or 20th century doesn't help. Be aware of the different information. I know it's disappointing when they, J, they just say J. Smith and no age. Search beyond the place of arrival. Beware of variant spelling, names and ships and broaden your awareness of records other than shipping lists. Cross-check, so important, and I think that was really spelled out by the previous speaker. We've got a lot of non-government records as well as government records. You need the resources, guides and skills of all the repositories. I think that's also pretty clear. And State Library provides key information for all Queenslanders on-site and remotely. Don't forget about our Ask Us service. I'm trying to skip over the two-hour free research because that's now one hour. And I've obviously forgot to alter that. Use the online catalogue to get lot, not just lists of books but lots of things which have been digitised. And use your free membership. And I've probably gone over, even though I tried to scoot. And it would be nice if you... If you've got some questions, certainly not just for me, but for the other speakers, are there any questions?